Um, again, I'm sort of contrarian, uh, and, and what I mean by that is uh, almost whatever someone else is doing, I almost have this natural tendency to do the opposite. And so I, I don't know what it is. It's probably just a rebellious nature, but... Um, you know, there's churches doing really big things today, really huge things. And I love those really big things. You know, there's uh, friends of ours did a uh, helicopter egg drop with 20,000 eggs yesterday. And, you know, kids running all over the place and adults running all over the place. And I was like, that's great. You know, some people would be maybe critical of that and saying, you know, this or that. But I, I actually said, it looks fun. looks good. Um, Jesus is all about fun, too. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's going to be big choirs today and, and again, amazing. Some of the dresses I saw out there, um, some of the guys look great. No, I mean, some of the, I'm sorry, so all the ladies look great. And the guys all dressed up. And it was really great, you know. And, and I think about all those things and it's amazing. But at the same time, I'm always mindful of the fact that Jesus... Uh, was kind of contrarian too. I mean, he did things differently than I would. He did things differently than anyone would. Um, you know, <laughs> you think if, if I came here and visited this earth, I'm not sure I would be born into a barn and I sure don't think I would exit on a cross. If those were my, if those were my preferences, if I was the king of the universe and could write the script, I'm not sure that's the script I would have written. But that's the script he wrote. And I, and I love that because it, it means that we have to think fresh when we come to um, the scriptures. And sometimes there's things like on this day that uh, a friend of mine used to call them CEO Christians, which is Christmas and Easter only. Um, you know, they come twice a year to the big messages. You know, here's the big message. And, and as a pastor over the years, I've, I've felt the pressure to be profound. I don't know if you know what that is in your own calling of life or something, but someone will say, this person's really smart. Say something smart. And you're like, uh, you know, <laughs> or they're really funny. Tell a joke. And you're like, uh, I can't think of any or, or whatever, just whatever it is you are. This person's a great cook. You got to try their meal. And you're like, Ooh, I don't know if this one was very good. And, and so you just sometimes in life have a, a role that you, you look at and you go, man, I don't know. Um, so this week, you know, was a, a strange week for me. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, again, uh, my father-in-law, who I dearly love and, and our family, uh, you know, in, in one of these life events that I've been a part of so many different ways, you know, but I've, I've, I've done hundred and probably a hundred plus funerals in my life. Uh, but some of them were for really close friends and some were, uh, were for family. And when I think about that, you know, that you go through different things and you think the resurrection, uh, man, I, I don't want to just give a, a, a message today in a way. I'm just kind of talking with you. I, I really, strangely enough, don't even really have notes. What I have is pictures, um, you know, in preparing this last night. It, what came to mind for me were pictures. And the first picture that came to mind, I just want to tell you happy Atheist Day, because this is a really strange time on the calendar. Did you happen to notice it's April Fool's Day? And um, I used to have a sticker on my Volkswagen bus, the old one that I had, that said, um, National Atheist Day, April 1st. Um, you know, and, and, and several people went, ah, that's funny, uh, because it had that scripture. It didn't say what it was. It just said Psalm 14.1, um, you know, National Atheist Day, April, uh, April 1st. Because um, this is the thought that I want to think on with you just as a beginning. This is not the message, but, but it's just a little slide. Um, the message uh, has, has more to do with this right here. Um, hopefully you can see that. I know the sun's a little bright, but hopefully you can see it. Um, but it's basically a Volkswagen bus out in the, in the field of flowers. And um, when I think about that, that's, that's my happy place. You know, um, happy places are good to have in life. And that to me looks like a very happy place. I don't know what your happy place is, but I was talking about that with my parents this week. They went back to South Dakota um, you know how when someone passes on to heaven, people always say, oh, they're in a better place now. Um, every once in a while, I'll say to someone, oh, they're in a better place. And they're like, they died? And like, no, no, they're in South Dakota. Um, you know, but, but when you think about that, there are better places even here on earth. There are different spots. But, you know, my, my parents, I had a great time with them. And they're back in that place uh, that they call home. Um, but they, 
you know, I, I think the more you live, the, the more you don't have a home anywhere. You have one everywhere and you don't have one anywhere. Like when I think about my own life, um, again, I'm just kind of sharing from my heart and thoughts today. Um, you know, Boulder, Colorado was a home to me. That's where, I, that's where I really grew up and did most of my growing up years, if I did that. If someone can do such a thing in Boulder, there's a lot of people who haven't grown up there no matter how old they are. But, but I think about that and I think it, it's, it's a happy place. And it's just a great place. There's it, the, when it snows, it's beautiful. When the snow you know, comes out and it's now warmed up to 45 degrees, everyone's out playing Frisbee with no shirt and stuff like that. And the dogs all have like little bandanas and everything. It's just, it's a, it's a great place, you know? And yet there's sorrow there, you know, there's people, there's graveyards there. In fact, um, you know, again, if my parents are, are dialed in, we talk about these things and, and have gone through them. My, my parents have gravestone um, reserved there in in Boulder, Colorado, in a, in a beautiful spot that has even a bench so that people could sit and look out at the mountains from that place. And, and I go, well, I'll, I'll sit there someday, right, if, if life is like that, you know. And so you think about those things and you go, it can be a happy place. Even those places can be happy places as you think back on. We had a happy place yesterday at the hospital. We were laughing and having fun and doing just what we would do in the room uh, you know, while, while Bill was there, just like we did when Bill was there, because Bill is there. So you know, I think about those things and I go, people deal with things all different ways, but I just think about the intersection of all these things in my life, you know, April Fool's Day, that that verse does matter to me because I don't see any fools in the room, you know, but I, I doubt that anyone in here completely doubts that there even is a God. Maybe, maybe you do. I've had those seasons in my life where I wasn't sure. But I think about this and, and I think... Could all of this just kind of happen? See, I think about this again. I, I give you the picture of the Volkswagen. That's a simple car. Oh my goodness. Compared to modern cars, this is a very simple car. There's like eight parts in this car and, and they're all easily identified back there in the engine, right? But nevertheless, as easy as that engine is to understand, I don't have any illusions that it just sort of happened. I don't have any concept in my mind that I go, man, look, a, a bus spontaneously exists in the middle of a field that spontaneously existed with flowers that just kind of came out of nowhere. And isn't that interesting how that happened? And I go, no, I, I, you know, again, I, I think you'd have, a, have to have a special brand of wise foolishness <laughs> to think that you're so smart that you think, well, this all just happened. It happened by accident. There is no God. There is no creator. So if there's a creation, for me, there's a creator. That's, that's easy enough. I don't even have to think too hard about that one. You know, I don't have to be a genius to figure that one out. But when I think about it, one of the other things that bothers me about creation is as beautiful as it is, there's things wrong with it right? It, a baby's born, it's so beautiful and so amazing, you know, and then something goes wrong or something goes wrong along the way or different things go on and you go, man, what? Life makes sense. Death, not so much. Why, why is it like this? Why is, is this world so incredibly beautiful and so powerful that somebody created it? It's so gorgeous. And yet something can go wrong with it. See, I think about it even this morning. Um, Carissa saw, I, I fell going down the stairs. Um, I ripped my perfectly good church pants. I can't believe this. These are my best church jeans. And uh, ripped the knee there. Um, I, I just missed the last step. I was talking and thinking about something else. But the great news is I felt like I used to. Oh, man, it wasn't a thud. It was a roll. It was amazing. I was just 16 again. We're coming off the skateboard. It was amazing. I was right back up. It's good. <laughs> no big deal. You know, I'm like, little scrape. I'll be good. Uh, knee will fix itself. It's great. You know, a couple weeks, that little thing will just be a scar to, to brag about. You know, what an amazing dismount that was. But again, I think about that. The world fell, right? The world fell, but it was a thud. It wasn't a bounce. It, it, it's, it's fallen. We live in a fallen world. When people think about that, sometimes they'll just say it and go, yeah, well, it's a fallen world. What does it mean? It means somehow it's short of the glory that God gave it, that it had a beauty that we see, but somehow there's an ugliness mixed in. 
And so I think about this. These are the words that I want to think with you about on this Resurrection Sunday, which is three words. And I, I cross through two of them because what you see is resuscitation. That's a pretty big word. That's a pretty important word, resuscitate. To resuscitate something is good. Restoration, that's a really cool word too. But resurrection to me is the biggest and boldest and best of all of those. See, because God is kind of in the resuscitation business. I could, I could say that. He is. And, you know, today I was going to drive our, our 1970 Volkswagen van, um, and it wouldn't start. I sat out there for like a good half an hour trying to get it to start. And I'm like, come on, baby. I mean, of all days, Daisy, to not make it to church. You got to make it to church. I'm, I'm talking about you and all your friends. You got to make it. And, and I said, no, nah, forget it. I'll get, you know, in there. But I'll resuscitate that car later. What does resuscitation mean? Well, resuscitation means to bring something back to the same point it was at, right? And again, I want you to think about these words in their context. See, biblically speaking, God's in the resuscitation business. Can I give you an example that you already know? Lazarus, right? Lazarus, he was resuscitated. Some people would say he was resurrected. No, he wasn't. He is now, but he wasn't then. In the Bible, he was simply resuscitated. Now, he was resuscitated from a pretty bad state, uh, the New King James or the King James Bible puts it this way, he stinketh. It was four days in the tomb, right? And yet Jesus says, ah, come on back. But remember this, Lazarus wasn't better than before. He was just extra innings, right? That's, that's all it was. I mean, he was resuscitated. He was brought back to life, but he was brought back to the very life he had before. If Lazarus had a bad knee, uh, you know, I'm conjecturing here on some level, but if he had a bad knee before he died in that passage, he came back with a bad knee too. I mean, Jesus could have fixed it. Maybe he did. But let's face it, Lazarus died again. You know that, right? He's not still with us today. So Lazarus, though he had an amazing miracle, I got to call this one of the biggies, right? This is a big deal. Jesus brought someone back to life. But remember, he just resuscitated him. He brought him back to the same point he was at before. So that's kind of a cool thing. But, it, you know, I can't do it in every case. Or, but maybe I could with a car. But I don't know that I could with a person. Might, you know. But even that would be considered a miraculous thing in some way. But, but not what I'm looking for. And then... Uh, I think about that with, again, our Volkswagen van. If I get it started again, it's still got all the other problems it's got. It's not like I'm doing a full restoration. But you could. You could do a full restoration of a vehicle. I've done that. I've been involved in that. I've taken a car out of a field and put it to a car show where it won a first place trophy. I mean, that's, that's a pretty cool thing to get to do. That was a lot of work. Um, in fact, uh, decided to have kids instead of cars. And so we have three kids instead of the six vehicles I used to have, right? I always try and ask them to make it a good trade, right? Because those were cool vehicles. Uh, but couldn't keep them all. But you think about restoration, what it was, it's to bring it back to the original state. Just like it came from that German factory, right? And, and to, to put everything back into those things. That's restoration. And that's pretty cool too. But the problem is, as the Reverend Neil Young put it, rust never sleeps. And rust never sleeps because when you think about it, cars in, in this world, no matter what you do with them, you can even put them on a showroom and they'll start to say it's an older restoration. Like if it goes to auction, it'll say this was restored 20 years ago. But it's already oxidizing and fading, even though they've got it in air-conditioned conditions and they've, you know, taking everything on it. The, the rubber starts to crack. The oil starts to leak. Everything, the fluids and everything, and you're like, what is wrong? And it's like, well, it's an older restoration. It needs to be restored yet again, constantly restored. And I think about that to bring it back to the original. There's just always this thing in this world that is entropy, right? And so... 
I wrote down, again, resurrection, at least my little definition for today is to be forever better than ever. Just forever better than ever. Like, wow, better than the factory? Better than the original? Better than it ever has been every day forever? And you go, yeah, that's resurrection. That's why we celebrate it. Well, not just once a year. I mean, there is a, a weekend or a week that people call Resurrection Week, and it's, you know, all the different things. And, uh, like, there's even a, something called a Monday Thursday, which as a kid, I was always like, what's Monday Thursday? How can it be Monday and Thursday at the same time? But anyway, all those things to say um, that Good Friday and Great Friday and every day is a Good Friday, you know, and all that stuff. But Resurrection... Man, there's a time where that intersects your life, my life, where it's like, I either believe this or I don't. And if I believe this, man, it changes everything. It changes everything. I can celebrate even on the worst of all possible days. I've got to be able to connect with what it is to resurrect and the promise that God says that is what we're headed toward. See, when I look at each one of you, I think, you know, most of you are in incredible low mileage original condition. You guys look fantastic and all the rest. Nobody needs a restoration here fully. But you know what? Give it some time. Give it some time. And so these are the pictures that I wanted to share with you. And this will be a short and hopefully sweet teaching. This is an original picture of an, a late 50s, early 60s. 23 window Volkswagen bus. Now you might look at that and say, that's a piece of junk. Well, auctioneers would disagree. This vehicle recently, one like this in low mileage, original condition, um, auctioned off north of $250,000. Now, when I think about that, um, there's people who say, that's just a plain, ugly, cute vehicle, right? It's like that puppy that's so cute and ugly at the same time that you go, oh, let me take it home. Um, you know, so it's so sweet. And so that right there is an actual picture from that time period, right? It just, someone snapped a picture of it. This was promotional brochure type of thing. And it's got that kind of, you know, late 50s, early 60s kind of look to it. And so that's original. And again, nobody here thinks that it didn't have a creator, right? It did have a creator. Somebody wrote that and, and drew that and people put that together. And as simple as it is, again, only a fool would possibly think that that just randomly appeared like that, you know? So of course it didn't. It had a creator. And then if you live in an idealistic world, right? This is a artist rendition of one of these vehicles. If you look closely later at the picture, it actually has like perfect blue skies and the little sand there and you're at the beach and there's your vehicle and it's shinier than it was when it was in the showroom and it's just always every day and endless summer, right? And this is what the songs are all about and beach boys and, and beach girls and we're just having fun playing volleyball and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, no one ever thinks about skin cancer, or any of those types of things. No, no, we're just forever young, you know, that kind of stuff. And you go, well, wait a minute. See, the problem with that is, again, that's an artist's conception. Now, you might think, again, life should be like that. Life should be like that. But see, if you take a vehicle like this to salt water, that beach is not going to look like this for very long. And, you know, we used to have times in Galveston, Texas, where they, you could actually camp on the beach. And we would take a vehicle down there. But, man, after everyone would take their show vehicles to the, uh, to the sandy beach, we would spend hours and hours and hours making sure there was no salt left on that vehicle. Because we knew, again, rust is going to get it. And so if I can connect the dots in any way with you, rust is sin to your soul, right? What, what sin is to your soul, that's what rust is to a vehicle. It's just this oxidizing thing that's just happening all the time. It's happening right now. Right now, there's these things called free radicals in your body, right? Why they gotta be so radical? Um, why they gotta be so free? And, and things are connecting to those and oxidizing you right now, <laughs> and you're rusting. And you go like, I don't know, I, I don't like that feeling, you know? Can you listen to it? Yeah, sort of. I can almost hear it. But that's a realistic view. The realistic view of life is there's rust. 
And so that vehicle that can look so wonderful one year, this is not too many years later, another one out here in the desert. Oh, look at the sand. What happened to the volleyball players? What happened to the beach? Where is all this stuff? How did the wonderful life become a desert? And, you know, missing headlights and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Well, what this vehicle could use and what the person probably did is resuscitation. You know what resuscitation looks like? It's keeping that car on the road in spite of the rust, right? That's all it is. Here's resuscitation. You go, wait, that looks just like the former picture. Well, yeah, it does. But again, if the engine's running and the transmission's transmitting and all that stuff, you can keep cars like this on the road for a long time. I've seen them. I've seen them at shows. They actually give trophies out for the one that the road warrior where they're just like, how is this vehicle still going? And yet everyone admires it because they're like, yikes, how can a car with that much beating still be going? And so I think about it, you know, maybe I'm maybe I can win that trophy these days. But resuscitation and I'm thankful for God's resuscitation. I'm thankful that the Bible says that though the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing Right? That there's times in life that you go through and there's things that my mind still thinks I can do and my body says, nope, not no more. Um, you know, we'll do that one on a video game instead. Okay, I'll play the, I'll play the Tony Hawk video game instead of actually skateboarding. Uh, because then I can fall and game over and restart. But my spirit is like more excited today than I was when I was a kid. It's, it's kind of funny sometimes to be around high school students because they're, they're like I was. Bored. Life's boring. I'm like... Life is so far from boring, and you get so out of that at some stage, hopefully. You get to the point where it's so exciting, and now your body's all rusted out and broken, and you're like, man, if only I had the enthusiasm of my aged life with the body of my younger life. Man, that would be an amazing thing. But, you know, reality is there's the realistic view. And so I go on from there to see real reality. Oh, man, look at that one. Look at that old soldier. Woo! Yikes. That is a, quite a reality. And you might say, I have finally found the picture that says a thousand words, words about how I feel today. Do you realize that guys like me look at that and go, oh, if I could only find that. <laughs> See, there's guys searching desperately all over the world for that. You know why? These are incredibly rare. They're very hard to find. They, they didn't have all of the rust inhibitors that they have today and so amazingly rare vehicles of all types many of them look just like this and a collector goes I'll take it I will in fact I will I will offer you what you need for that because I can do something with that and see I have whether you believe it or not I have seen vehicles that bad end up this good it's hard to believe but I've seen it the process can take a long time, but again, that's restoration, to bring it back to the original. To look at something like this and say, well, it's got good bones. Um, uh, there's, there's at least three parts I can use, and I can, I can start from there, and I can restore. I'm just, I'm just going back and putting it right like it was at the factory. And again, that restoration, when people have all the pictures of that and they show it, it, guys will sit at shows and just look at it and go, wow, I can't believe how bad it was and how good it is. Again, it's just short of miraculous if I were to show you those two and say this is the before picture. You know the before and after pictures? That's the before and this is the after. You go, I barely believe it. But you can believe it because there's somebody who didn't just create it. There's also people who love to recreate, who love to restore, who love to resuscitate, who love to do all of these things because there's a joy in seeing something go from messed up to dressed up, right? I mean, it's a pretty cool thing when it happens. But that is where I kind of land it today. If there's a thought that I look at that, I go, that restoration, the problem with that one is give it a few more years. And there you go. We're back here again. <laughs> and you go like, man, what happened? What happened? And that's where I, I bring it to resurrection. This is what Jesus has promised you. This is what Jesus has promised me will be true in my life, to be forever better than ever. That this that he created was a foreshadowing and a foretaste. What is it? This is just a tiny little 
preview, if you will, of eternity. And I love the way somebody put it that it really went into my mental notes and even my little notebook at home, which is we are not physical beings have a, having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience, right? This is just a tiny little dot on eternity that's accomplishing a goal that God has. What is that goal that he has? That we would choose to follow him. Everything God created has a choice. When you think about it, he created the angels, and the angels had a choice. And so some of them chose well, some of them didn't. Those who didn't, we don't see them everywhere we go, but the Bible talks about them all the time. And if you don't believe in the you know, unseen realm of things, I still come back to that opening verse. The, only the fool could say in their heart, everything I see is everything there is. You go, oh, man. To be such a materialist. Again, I, I look at those things and say, most of what we didn't see for all of human history, people didn't know even a hundred years ago that that chair had more space in it than it has matter in it. And you're sitting on it and you're thinking, I have molecules spinning around inside me sitting on a chair that's spinning around, sitting on an earth that's spinning around out in the middle of everything. And you go, really, you got to be a scientist to not believe in God? I think you got to be a scientist to believe in God. And the more you learn about science, the bigger the creator gets, because the more amazing the creation gets. He didn't just build a little 40 horsepower Volkswagen bus. I mean, look around. Look at the DNA structure. Look at all of this stuff. And you go, fascinating in its complexity. But resurrection, what he says is, ah, that, that's the beta model. You look at your body. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're pretty impressive, really, but we're really not. I mean, again, you've got a few parts. You've got a few major parts, and they can even do some replacement parts, right? These days, it's getting incredible what they can do, right? But what they cannot do is replace a soul, right? That's the thing that God puts in somebody, and he says, I'm going to do that. And you have a choice in this life for that soul to grow close to God and be housed forever with God. That's what, that's what he's doing. Does it always make sense to me? No. Do I understand everything the creator does? No. Uh, but I can look at the before and after with God in my life where he, I came in as a physical being, right? I'm doing things, but I didn't really have an awareness and desire for God to lead my life. But there came a point where I did. And when I did, I saw him doing restoration and resuscitation. But frankly, not resurrection yet. He hasn't resurrected me. I'm still the same old stinky, stupid Scott I've ever been, right? I still get tired and cranky and annoying uh, and all that stuff. But there's something inside me that's just a little better engine than I used to have, right? It's like, God's given me a mind and a soul to want to follow after him. And so I have one picture, or really two, that I hope you'll walk away from today with about what resurrection is to be better forever better and better than ever it's just that i'm like it's a limo somebody did this same bus except they stretched it out so now it's got more seats for more people you can put a longer surfboard on this thing. You can go camping, and there's if you lay on the camp bed on that, you're not gonna have to crouch or any of that kind of stuff. There might even be a like a cool stereo in that thing. All stuff that was not original equipment. AM radio is what you got if you had a really nice upgrade on the original, right? This thing's got like woofers and subwoofers and sub subwoofers and all that kind of stuff. It's got a light kit underneath it. It's got an amazing engine behind this thing. I, this is a real vehicle out there. And it's like resurrection. Now, some purists would say, no, give me the original back. And I'm like, well, what's funny is, again, you can't see it as well as I can see it. But in this picture, there's actually a reflection of the origin, original one next to it. So 
it's kind of like in the paint of this amazing limo is the another original one reflected in it. And I'm like, this is so great. This is the verse I want to leave you with. This is the verse I want to leave you with. This is an amazing <laughs> thought, man. I, this, is, this is the hope we have. This is what Easter is. Again, all over the world, people are trying to explain this to people. And some people are explaining it far better than I am with way better scriptures and illustrations that are not Volkswagen buses, right? And I understand my passion is not yours, but fill in the blank with whatever it might be. It's this. He says, my friends, we are now children of God. We're already that, right? But what we will be has not yet been revealed. Like we don't, we don't really know all that we will be but it's going to be better than ever forever is basically what he says. But here's what we know. We will be like him. We will see him face to face. See, Jesus was not just resuscitated from the tomb when they said he's risen. He was not just restored up back to back to Jesus right before. He was resurrected. Do, do you know after the story of him not being in the tomb, all of the disciples, they didn't know what to expect, but they sure didn't expect what they saw. And what they saw was Jesus popping in and out of rooms with the door locked, showing up in one place and then being somewhere else a little while later. See, when Jesus was here on earth the first time, he was subject to our limitations. When you think about this, he was just him, but he had the equivalent of a 40 horsepower engine in him. Right? But he comes back resurrected and he could do things like ascend <laughs> into heaven. And you think about that and you go, I want that. Where do I get that upgrade? And he says, Follow me. You're already created by me, you're already resuscitated by me daily, you're al already restored by me as the Bible uses all those words, but he says, it's a foretaste of what I'm going to do. I'm doing part three. And can I remind you that as big and cool as these words are, they got nothing on resurrection. Resuscitation, okay. Restoration, okay. Resurrection, now we're talking. And this is what Jesus has come to do, and that changes my every day. I can rust away I can, you know, end up looking like this in my physical state. And I say, man, I am headed for here. And when you go through that, whatever it is, again, fill in the blank with whatever makes sense to you. Take, let God give you the pictures of what this is. But don't lose the reality of that scripture. Right now, we've got a foretaste. But in eternity, we get the full taste of what he is. We get to see him and be like him. Not be him, but be like him. Everything that Jesus is, we will get to be. The Bible says you don't even really understand that fully now, but you will. You will, and believe me, you're gonna like it. So God, thank you for the fact that we can have a promise that's bigger than uh, anything anyone could give us here on earth. You have given us, again, scenes that we can see. We can look out over a a wonderful nature scene and think somebody made this and whoever they were they're pretty good and then we look down and somebody's thrown their lunch bag on the on the ground and it's just it's a realization that there's always something short of perfect or you get stung by a bee and say what in the world is going on here uh, in this beautiful place and then you realize god that we have fallen uh, fallen from the glory, but at that same time, it gives us an amazing time to make a choice to say, do we want to go toward the rust of sin or the rest of the Savior that you have given us? And God, we would put ourselves in your hands and say, the same one who created me sure knows how to restore, to resuscitate, and even to resurrect to a better forever. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.